on World News Tonight. Taiwan Trouble The US Congress meets with Taiwan's president amid mounting tensions from China. A population boom. India struggles to curtail an exponential rate of fertility as it nears the title of the world's most populous nation. Fall back. Bakhmut is out of Ukraine's hands with Zelensky announcing new coalition hopes. And friends for life. Filipino craftsmen give the gift of love by bringing back the memory of man's best friends. This is Adaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and you're joining us on World News where we bring to you news from across the globe. And we start off tonight with the news that took the world by storm. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and a bipartisan congressional delegation met with Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen despite threats from China. The meeting comes as tensions between the U.S. and China are already high. Striking a defiant tone, Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen shook hands and traded smiles with Democratic and Republican lawmakers in a historic meeting on U.S. soil. Taiwan strives to be a reliable partner to the world a cornerstone for stability in the region. The politically sensitive session underscores U.S. lawmakers' growing support for Taiwan as tensions simmer with China. Saying democracy was under threat, Tsai thanked the U.S. for standing by Taipei's side. In the discussion with congressional leaders this morning, I reiterated Taiwan's commitment to defending the peaceful status quo. Their presence and unwavering support reassure the people of Taiwan that we are not isolated and we are not alone. The meeting is expected to draw a strong response from Beijing, whose one-China policy declares itself the only Chinese government, under which it claims Taiwan as its own territory. It therefore views any interaction between the U.S. and Taiwan as a challenge to its claim to the island. Washington does not endorse Beijing's position and remains Taiwan's key provider of military and defense assistance. Last August, China responded to a visit by then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan with its largest military military drills in decades. George Washington University law professor Catherine Ross has stated that former U.S. former President Donald Trump's lawyers will have a hard time defending him against 34 felony counts of falsifying business records. This comes as the former president made statements criticizing the nation's judicial system. Donald Trump called on his fellow Republicans in Congress to defund the FBI and Department of Justice, a day after pleading not guilty in New York to 34 felony charges. Posting on his online platform Truth Social, the former U.S. president lashed out at federal law enforcement, saying both bodies had been weaponized by the Democrats to interfere with what he falsely claimed were already under siege elections. He also claimed that the indictment against him has no merit and there was no crime committed. But while Trump is taking aim at federal authorities, they are not the ones pursuing the unprecedented charges against him in New York. They are leading some of the other legal challenges Trump faces. Two Justice Department criminal investigations headed up by special counsel Jack Smith. One over Trump's efforts to overturn the results of the 2020 elections and the other on classified documents the former president allegedly retained after leaving office. Both of those have seemed to accelerate in recent months. After returning to Florida from New York, Trump accused Smith of targeting him rather than President Joe Biden over keeping documents. Everybody's done. In fact, Hillary Clinton got rid of 33,000 emails and that was okay. But nobody's done it like Joe Biden. However, it's unlikely Congress will take Trump up on defunding. While Republicans control the House, Democrats lead the Senate. And it will be a sharp turn for the GOP. In the past, Republicans have supported strong funding for law enforcement and in recent years have criticized proposals from the left to defund local police. Trump himself appointed current FBI Director Christopher Wray after he fired Wray's predecessor James Comey in 2017. 
The state of Georgia is also probing Trump on whether he unlawfully sought to overturn his 2020 election loss there. Now over in neighboring India, in the Indian district of Kishangang, families have on average five children, the highest fertility rate of any district in India, soon to be the world's most populous nation. This is my fourth child. I was hoping for a boy, but it didn't happen. I have a baby girl. Chandani Devi tries to fight back tears in a hospital ward as her newborn girl lies next to her. The 36-year-old comes from the Kishanganj district in the eastern Indian state of Bihar, one of the country's poorest states. Women in Kishanganj have on average five children, the highest fertility rate of any district in India. Successive state governments have been aware of the population growth problem there and mounted various programs to curb it. But it's mostly been a losing battle. Let's take a closer look at why. Most of the people here are illiterate. They find it difficult to understand family planning measures, even if we try to explain it to them. Every day, government health worker Pratima Kumari travels to villages to meet young married couples. She offers condoms and birth control pills for free and talks to the couples about the benefits of having just two children. There are so many misconceptions amongst the people, which makes it difficult for us to help them understand these things. This is the reason why the total fertility rate is high in this region. Kishanganj and Bihar are exceptions in India, which has over the decades controlled its population growth. The national fertility rate fell to two children between 2019 and 2021, official data shows. But Bihar, one of India's least developed states, has the highest fertility rate of 2.98. Local governments have been trying to curb the population growth problem. Besides the free distribution of condoms and birth control pills, the state pays 3,000 Indian rupees, about $36.50 to women who get sterilized, and 4,000 rupees to men. But some men refuse to undergo sterilization, thinking the procedure would harm their masculinity. Senior government officials in Bihar said they were fighting a losing battle. A 2021 Bihar Planning and Development Department report said the state had a sterilization target of more than 800,000 people in 2020, but managed just over 400,000. Former New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern said farewell to politics with a rousing speech that assured other nerds, criers and huggers that they too could one day lead. Jacinda Ardern never thought she'd make it here. Wearing a Korowai, a Maori feather cloak today, she bid farewell to Parliament. I've always believed this to be a place where you can make a difference. I leave knowing that to be true. Taking stock of her time in office. A domestic terror attack, a volcanic eruption, a pandemic. The terror attack in Christchurch humbled her, she said, and she will now work to combat violent extremism. At just 37 years old, she was New Zealand's second youngest leader in more than 150 years. She was the second world leader after Pakistan's Benazir Bhutto to become a mother in office, making headlines when she brought her three-month-old daughter to the UN General Assembly. But today was about gratitude, about imploring her colleagues to do more on climate change, and most powerfully, about leaving the door firmly open. You can be anxious, sensitive, kind, and wear your heart on your sleeve. You can be a mother or not. You can be a nerd, a crier, a hugger. You can be all of these things. And not only can you be here, you can lead just like me. Setting a legacy she hopes will be followed. France's interior minister Gerald Darmanin must fend off fierce criticism as he is questioned by MPs and senators on the use of force by the French police and gendarmerie during recent protests that have shaken France. The world has watched the violence unfold in France in recent weeks. During the protests against the pension reform and the crackdown on demonstrations against new water reservoirs in the west of the country, police have been filmed using force. Interior Minister Gérald Darmanin is being grilled in Parliament this Wednesday on whether this force has been unacceptably violent. 
He's blamed the violence on rioters and the far left, who he accuses of trying to destroy democracy. The far left and the extreme left want chaos and have called for public buildings to be burned and for police and gendarmes to be murdered. Since the protests took hold in January, more than 440 police and gendarmes have been injured, but no official figure has been provided for the number of injured civilians. The Council of Europe, NGOs and a UN special rapporteur have all warned against the use of excessive force by French police. In 2019, the UN asked the French government to conduct an in-depth review of every alleged instance of police abuse, a request which critics say has fallen on deaf ears. Damanas said on Sunday that since the start of the protests, internal inspectors have been looking into the actions of 38 officers and gendarmes. Meanwhile, local prosecutors have begun their own inquiries, for instance, surrounding the reservoir protest in saint soline Je lance un appel à témoins. I'm launching an appeal for direct testimonies of the facts surrounding these four victims. These clashes left a number of campaigners seriously injured, with one still in a coma after 11 days. We're going into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said that during a trip to Warsaw that Poland would help form a coalition of Western powers to supply warplanes to Kyiv, adding that Ukrainian troops were still fighting for Bakhmut in the east but would withdraw if they risk being cut off. President Volodymyr Zelensky said on Wednesday that Ukrainian troops were still fighting for Bakhmut but could pull out if they risked being cut off. For me, the most important is not to lose our soldiers. And of course, if there is a moment of even hotter events and the danger we could lose our personnel because of encirclement, of course, the corresponding correct decisions will be taken by generals there. Zelensky appeared to be referring to the idea of withdrawing. Ukrainian military commanders have stressed the importance of holding Bakhmut and other cities prior to an anticipated counteroffensive in the coming weeks or months. Bakhmut, in Ukraine's Donetsk province, has proven one of the bloodiest and longest battles of Russia's invasion. Kyiv's forces have held out against a Russian onslaught with heavy losses on both sides. The city has been reduced to ruins after months of fighting. However, Ukraine's deputy defense minister later said the situation at the front was, quote, completely under control, despite repeated Russian attempts to take Bakhmut and other cities. Could not verify the battlefield reports. Zelensky made the comments on a visit to Poland, where he thanked the country for its, quote, historic help in rallying Western support for Ukraine. During his visit, Poland announced it would send an additional 10 MiG fighter jets to Kyiv. The country has provided vital weaponry to Kyiv since Russia's invasion in February 2022 and has taken in millions of Ukrainian refugees. It's also played a big role in persuading Western allies to supply battle tanks and other heavy weapons to Kyiv. The 25-year-old man burst into a preschool in southern Brazil and killed four children with a hatchet-like weapon before turning himself into police, an attack President Lula da Silva condemned as monstrous. Outside a preschool in Blumenau, in southern Brazil, parents consoled each other after a fatal attack at the school. Police allege a 25-year-old man wielding an axe gained access to the private school by scaling its walls. He has since been arrested. Among the victims sit a firefighter, are three boys and a girl between the ages of five and seven. Of the injured, one of them was listed in serious condition, he said. The injured are between the ages of three and five, a local hospital said. <laughs> President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva described the attack as a monstrosity on social media. Community members living near the preschool came to lay flowers and pay their respects to the young victims. We live here in the region. We have children studying at schools near the kindergarten, and we put ourselves in their shoes. 
they could have been our children too. I hope that everyone comes here to bring some support. It's not an easy situation. It's quite difficult. The attack comes nearly a week after a 13-year-old student stabbed a teacher to death and injured five others in Sao Paulo. Officials said at least five people were killed in a pre-dawn tornado that struck southeast Missouri in the latest of powerful storm systems that have been sweeping through the U.S. South and Midwest. Yet another deadly tornado ripped through the American Midwest on Wednesday, this time southeast of Missouri. Several people were killed in Bollinger County in the pre-dawn twister, according to officials. Aerial footage showed the extent of the damage, with roofs sheared off houses, trees splintered and power lines downed. Missouri Governor Mike Parson said the rural area faces, quote, a long journey ahead towards recovery and added that President Joe Biden had called to offer help. Storm spotters reported seeing the tornado touch down around 3.30 a.m. local time, according to the National Weather Service. The agency also said it was one of more than a dozen seen in the Midwest overnight. The twister struck amid a series of violent storms sweeping through the South and Midwest. Oh, oh my God. On Tuesday, dramatic eyewitness video captured the moment a tornado whipped through a field in Iowa. Oh my God! While footage shot in neighboring Illinois showed terrifying scenes oh as the storm hit a residential area. More than 30 people were killed over the previous weekend as tornadoes tore through multiple states in the south and Midwest. And a week before that, a swarm of thunderstorms unleashed a powerful tornado that destroyed the Mississippi Delta town of Rolling Fork and killed more than two dozen people. Johnson & Johnson has agreed to pay an $8.9 billion to settle tens of thousands of lawsuits alleging that talc in its iconic baby powder and other products caused cancer. The amount dwarfs J&J's original offer of $2 billion. Johnson & Johnson has agreed to pay $8.9 billion to settle the tens of thousands of lawsuits that allege the talc in its iconic baby powder and other products caused cancer. The company said in a statement that about 60,000 talc claimants had agreed to the proposal. This investigation in 2018 revealed J&J knew for decades about tests showing its talc sometimes contained carcinogenic asbestos. But the pharma giant kept that information from regulators and the public. J&J has argued its baby powder and other talc products are safe, do not cause cancer and do not contain asbestos. The firm announced three years ago that it would stop selling its talc baby powder in the US and Canada due to what it called misinformation about the product. It later announced its aim to discontinue sales worldwide this year. Tuesday's agreement follows a January appeals court ruling which invalidated a controversial bankruptcy move. J&J sought to offload the talc liability onto a subsidiary that immediately filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. J&J and its subsidiary have argued the bankruptcy served a greater good for all parties. It said restructuring could deliver settlement payouts more fairly than what it called a lottery offered by trial court, where some litigants get large awards and others get nothing. But some plaintiff lawyers argue J&J's move was an abuse of the bankruptcy system. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news let's take you around the world in a minute. Britain said that it had leased a barge of house 500 migrants on its southern coast as part of efforts to reduce the use of costly hotels as temporary accommodation while asylum claims are being processed. The vessel, the BB Stockholm, will be berthed in Portland Port in Dorset and will accommodate 500 single adult males. 
thousands of people across Ontario are without power as thunderstorms and freezing rain hit the province. The storms began earlier Wednesday with tornado watches issued in the southern region of the province, including in Windsor, Essex and Chatham, Kent. Four times Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi has been diagnosed with leukemia. The 86-year-old Berlusconi has been treated in intensive care since Wednesday in a cardiac unit of Milan's San Rafael Hospital after suffering breathing problems. The foreign ministers of Iran and Saudi Arabia met in Beijing for the first formal meeting of their most senior diplomats in more than seven years after China broke a deal to restore ties between the regional rivals. After three years of failed rains, the animals in the southern Ethiopian village of Kura Khalicha are dying. Dozens of decomposing cattle carcasses lie on the parched earth, their flesh picked over by scavengers. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we end tonight with a visit to a factory in Manila where the manufacturers are bringing back pets of the days past back to life in the form of plushies. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and have a good night.